Welcome to this presentation entitled Introduction to Cold Fusion for Beginner Developers, Decision Makers, and CEOs. Uh, but let's call this what it really is. This is uh, Cold Fusion 101. Let's start by setting some expectations on who this presentation is for, who it's not for, what you're going to learn, and what you are not going to learn. So this presentation is for people who are new to development. It's for people who have an idea of a software project but don't know how to get it done. Um, it's for people who are curious about Cold Fusion and people who are using Cold Fusion wondering if or why they should keep using it. This presentation is not for people who aren't involved with the development process. If you're only involved in the marketing of a website or you're only involved in sales, you might not really catch anything out of this. This is not for Cold Fusion developers. You guys already know this stuff. It's not for people who believe that Cold Fusion is dead or have a bias against it in favor of some other language. If you're coming into this presentation thinking that PHP is the best language in the world and nothing could ever top it, then I'm not here to change your mind. Today you're going to learn the basics of how the web works. You're going to learn the very basics of how Cold Fusion works. We're going to discuss some simple Cold Fusion syntax. We will talk about the major Cold Fusion frameworks. I'm going to give you an overview of the Cold Fusion developer community and where to find various Cold Fusion resources. And then we'll talk about some facts and misconceptions. Today, you are not going to learn how to install Cold Fusion. There's lots of tutorials out there on how to get Cold Fusion installed. It's software, it's not that difficult. Um, you're not going to learn how to be a Cold Fusion developer. This is supposed to be a basic overview. You are not supposed to learn how to uh, become a Cold Fusion developer based on the information in this presentation. You're not going to learn the answer to a specific problem you're having in Cold Fusion, therefore. Um, we're not really going to get into specific problems, but you will, again, get an overview. You're also not going to hear me say that Cold Fusion is the absolute best, and that's the end of the story, because the bottom line is that Cold Fusion is a single tool in a very large toolbox. And I strongly encourage people to use all of the tools in that toolbox. You wouldn't build a house using only a hammer. Um, very important tool, but not the only thing you need to build that house. So by the end of this session, you should know the fundamentals of what Cold Fusion is and how it works from, again, a 10,000 foot view perspective. Um, you should be able to talk the basics about Cold Fusion to a developer without your eyes glossing over. And hopefully you'll have a little bit of fun. Moving on to the obligatory biography slide. Uh, who am I? My name is David Byers. I have been a web developer for over 20 years. I am currently one of the senior developers at Epicenter Consulting, based out of New York. I'm active on the Cold Fusion community portal. I'm a raconteur. All that means is that I tell stories, as you will quickly learn. Um, and I live in Las Vegas with uh, three cats and four house bunnies. And trust me, the cats and the bunnies rule the roost. But I wasn't always a developer. See, I grew up in rural Nova Scotia, Canada. And when I was growing up, I would come home after school and watch sitcom reruns on TV every afternoon. One of the sitcoms I was particularly interested in is this one, WKRP in Cincinnati. It's about a group of people who flip the format on a radio station from classical music to rock and their madcap misadventures. Specifically, there was one character that appealed to me, and that was this guy, Dr. Johnny Fever. He was the coolest guy in the room, no matter what, and had a ton of charisma, and everybody seemed to like him. So for some whatever reason, he was the character that I gravitated towards. So after high school, I went to college. I took a job at a local radio station. Comp 92.3. The station with a heart. We keep it in a fridge down the hall. And I started to live kind of a rock star lifestyle, you know? Here I am in the mid-90s hanging out in the studio with Ted Nugent. I was their remote broadcast engineer. I was on-air talent. Um, but primarily, I was the station's promotion director. It's my job to figure out all the fun and creative and interesting ways to engage listeners and give away all those fun prizes that radio stations tend to give away. CDs, hats, t-shirts, concert tickets, you name it. Well, one day I get a call from the record company, and the record company tells me that they've got Motley Crue coming to concert in Las Vegas. They're going to be playing at the Aladdin Theater for the Performing Arts. And to help promote the show, they're going to give me a pair of front row tickets to give away to this concert. Now, mid-90s, this was a big deal. You know, this is a big band. It was the very last show at the Aladdin before it got imploded. 
um, you know, we wanted to have some fun with this. And we were trying to come up with fun and creative ways to be able to give this pair of tickets away. Well, at the time, Tommy Lee was married to Pamela Anderson. And they had various adult scandals happening in their personal and professional lives that everybody was in touch with. So we came up with this idea on how to give away these front row tickets. We said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a balloon. We're going to attach a coupon to the front of that balloon for that pair of front row tickets. We're going to then fill that balloon with gas and we're going to let it loose over the city of Las Vegas. And whoever brings us the coupon off the balloon for the pair of front row tickets will then receive the tickets. Except we didn't use a balloon. In order to keep this family friendly, let's just say we used an adult inflatable likeness of the female form. And that's what we used as our balloon, which we then attached a coupon for the pair of front row tickets and let loose over the city of Las Vegas. Now, you're probably wondering to yourself, what the heck does any of this have to do with cold fusion? Well, okay. What this taught me was how to learn to solve problems logically and be details oriented. Now, (laughs) I know this is a stretch, but bear with me here, because when you're doing a promotion like this, you have to think of a lot of things, much like in the web development realm. You have to ask yourself questions like, how do we execute on this idea? We don't want the balloon to go too high, so how do we limit that? Do we need to put helium and oxygen in it so that it'll limit the altitude. We don't want to just let it go in the parking lot and have it take off and nobody ever see it again. Do we need to add weights to the balloon? What do we do here? What are the risks involved? Does is the duct tape that we're going to use to affix the coupon to the front of the balloon have metal fibers in it? What if that hits a power line? You know, are we going to black out a good section of Las Vegas with our stupid little balloon stunt? And then, of course, we want to know, will the intended audience even embrace this idea? We want people chasing the balloon. Are they going to chase it or are they going to do what some listeners did and start shooting at it to try to bring the balloon to them? What happens if nobody catches it? Do we have an alternative way to be able to give these tickets away? You know, so we're asking all of these questions and it really taught me how to be details oriented, which is critical when you're solving problems on the web. So the year was 1995. And at the time, the radio station used to broadcast the Super Bowl live on the air. It was the uh, 49ers and Chargers. I honestly can't even remember who won the game. I used to run the game from the on-air studio, and I'd watch the the game on TV in the studio, which was fun. But, of course, the other thing that you used to look for was the Super Bowl commercials. This particular Super Bowl was important because it was the first time you really saw web addresses, URLs, at the end of commercials. So you'd see things like Pepsi.com and Nike.com and Budweiser.com. So the next day I went into the vice president of Lotus Broadcasting, a guy named Tony Benici, and I said, Tony, we need to build some websites for the radio stations. And I'll never forget his response. He looked at me square in the eye. He dropped his shoulders. He sighed heavily and he said, seriously, do you really think this internet thing is going to take off? Because at the time, again, mid-90s, 95, some people thought the internet was a fad. Well, I looked at Tony and I said, yeah, I got a feeling this is going to be big. And he says, okay, if you want to build websites for the radio station, you can do it, but you're getting no extra time, you're getting no extra budget, you're getting no extra anything. And I said, okay. And I skipped away from his office, satisfied, I'm going to build some websites for the radio station. Then reality struck, and I said, I have no idea how to do this. I don't even know what happens from the moment that I hit enter in the address bar of my computer and the point where that website shows up in my browser. So the very first thing I needed to learn was the A to Z of a web request. See, your computer has to ask itself a lot of questions once you say, bring up Disney.com. The first thing your computer has to ask is, do I even know where Disney.com is? And if it doesn't, it has to reach out over the internet. And it has to ask the internet, hey, where's Disney.com? Well, that response comes from a server called a DNS server. The DNS server responds and says, that website is located at this IP address. Great. So now your computer knows where Disney.com is. Next, your computer says, hey, IP address, can you give me Disney.com, please? That request goes to that particular web server. 
That web server responds and says, yeah, all right, and serves you back Disney.com. Sure enough, it appears on your screen. Now, all of this happens in a fraction of a second. Um, at the time, it was a little bit slower because most people were on dial-up. However, the DNS request, the web server request, really is super, super fast. But even more is happening. That web server itself has to ask itself a bunch of questions. It has to ask itself, do I even have a website called Disney.com? Where is it located on my local hard drive? What's the default file that needs to be sent? And then what it needs to do is it needs to gather all of this information and send it back to the person making the request, which was great. Again, this is the early days of the internet when websites were mostly static. The code, the text, the images that appeared in the file were exactly what got sent to the person making the request. So it didn't take long before Tony, the vice president of Lotus Broadcasting, started to get on board with this whole internet thing. And a couple of years later, after the websites had been running for a while, he said to me, and this was kind of the cool request at the time, he said, David, I want you to add today's date to the top of the website. Pretty simple request, right? And I said, okay. How am I going to pull this off? Well, I came up with a solution, and it was an absolutely horrible, awful solution to how to add the date to the top of the web page. Again, this was the mid-90s, so having today's date or the date the website was last updated at the top of the page was really cool. Well, here's my solution. I said, I need to stay up until midnight. I need to download the homepage file. I need to change the date. I need to upload the homepage file and then I'll be done. This is an absolutely awful idea because what happens is seven days a week, I had to stay up until midnight, download the homepage file, change the date, upload the homepage file, and be done. Next day, stay up until midnight, download the homepage file, change the date, upload the homepage file, done. Wednesday, repeat the process. Thursday, repeat the process. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you get the idea this was the worst solution ever. Because when you're a promotion director for the radio station, you're working a lot with the morning show, I was getting up at four in the morning. So for me to stay up until midnight meant I was not getting a whole lot of sleep. And it started to affect my job. So I did what every good programmer does pretty quickly when they come across a problem like this. They ask, can't somebody else do this? Like this seems like it should be something that can be automated, something that can be uh automatically determined on the server what the date is and display it automatically without me having to download the file, change the date, re-upload it, and be done. How do I take that static website and turn it into something that's parsed or pre-processed? That's when a friend of mine suggested that I check out Cold Fusion. Now, what is Cold Fusion? I'm going to start with the technical definition. Cold Fusion is a server-side Java pre-parser that turns ColdFusion markup language, CFML, into Java bytecode for the handling of web server requests. CFML pages are pre-processed on the server and Java bytecode classes are dynamically created that act as page handlers for incoming web server requests. Now that's a long technical definition. Honestly, I don't even remember where I got it. It could have been me, I've, I don't know. But what happens is this changes the A to Z of a web request. So now the A to Z of a cold fusion web request is that your computer makes the request over the internet, it hits that web server, that web server then passes that off to cold fusion, which does the pre-parsing, then returns the result to the web server, which returns it over the internet back to your computer. Now I wanna talk about cold fusion for a second. When you hear the phrase cold fusion, you're really talking about one of two separate things. There's cold fusion server and there's cold fusion markup language or CFML. But many developers simply refer to both of these as cold fusion. Cold fusion server is the software that runs on the web server. It parses CFML into Java bytecode. Cold Fusion markup language, however, is the programming language that is interpreted by the Cold Fusion server software. It consists of tags and functions, and it can be written in tag-based or script-based fashion. A brief history of the ownership of Cold Fusion, it was originally created by JJ and Jeremy Allaire. Uh, version 1 was released by the Allaire Corporation in 1995. At the time, it wasn't even referred to as Cold Fusion. It was actually called DBML. Um, Allaire got acquired by Macromedia in early 2001. Macromedia was then acquired by Adobe in April of 2005. 
Um, when you look at the releases for Cold Fusion over the last 25 years, they have been very steady. You know, uh, Alair Cold Fusion came out in July of 95, followed by 1.5, version 2, version 3, version 4. Version 4 really is where most developers, I think, started picking up Cold Fusion. If you ask a lot of developers when they started with Cold Fusion, this was about the time that um, a lot of them picked it up. Followed by Cold Fusion 4.5. This is when the ownership acquisition took over and uh, Macromedia released their first version, Cold Fusion 5, in June of 2001. Followed by Cold Fusion MX. There was a massive shift between Cold Fusion 5 and Cold Fusion MX because the engine switched from being based on C language to being based on top of Java. Um, that might be a little too technical for this presentation, but big paradigm shift in the way that Cold Fusion worked between Cold Fusion 5 and Cold Fusion MX, followed by Cold Fusion 7 in 2005. And then Adobe took over. When Adobe took over, they released Cold Fusion 8, 9, 10, 11. That's when they switched the naming uh, mechanism and started going off of year releases as opposed to version releases. So Cold Fusion 2016 came out in February of 2016. Cold Fusion 2018, July of 2018. And we are on the precipice, as of the time of this recording, of Cold Fusion 2020 being released. So as you can see, lots of releases, very consistent timeline. Um, Cold Fusion is constantly being updated with new features and new functionality. Now, one of the questions is, how does the web server know what to serve? How does it know whether to serve a static page or that parsed or pre-processed page? And how it does that is through the use of the ColdFusion file extensions. There are three of them. The first one is CFM, .cfc, and .cfml. Now, I've been a developer for over 20 years. CFML technically works. I've never seen anybody use it. Anybody that I've ever known has always just used filename.cfm or filename.cfc. So what happens is if the web server sees that the file being requested is a .cfm file, .cfc file, or .cfml file, it knows, hey, this is a cold fusion request and it needs to be pre-processed through the cold fusion server before I return it back to the client. Now I want to take a brief detour because you may have noticed that I'm explicitly using the words parsed or pre-processed as opposed to the word dynamic. So why am I not calling it dynamic? Well, cold fusion pages are parsed on the server and static content is delivered to the web server and subsequently the browser. There are dynamic front end technologies out there that provide a more dynamic user experience. When you think of things like Google Maps where you originally load the map and it's centered on a location and the map appears and then you move the map and all of a sudden more data comes in and uh, the map refreshes with the streets in that area. Uh, you know, these rely on communicative technologies like Ajax, uh, Vue, React, Angular. These are really dynamic languages that pull data from the server based on the requests on the client side. Truth be told, many of these could be receiving data from a cold fusion backend. However, the end result of almost any cold fusion request is a static HTML file asterisk. The reason I say asterisk is because cold fusion is capable of returning data in many, many, many different formats, including JSON, XML, WDDX, binary, you name it. It's a modern language. It has a lot of capabilities depending on how it's used, but that's all outside of the scope of this presentation. Again, I wanted to give you a 10,000 foot view. So let's get back to my midnight problem. And to that end, I will now share with you the three lines of CFML that changed my life. Okay. It started off with CF output. Then I said date format now, gave it a date mask of MDYYYY, and then NCF output. That's it. That was my first Cold Fusion file. Now, like I said earlier, Cold Fusion markup language consists of two different kinds of code. It consists of tags and it consists of functions. So I'm going to take that same three lines of code and I'm going to break it down for you. This first one, CF output, that's a tag. The third line, the slash CF output, also known as a closing tag, that's a tag. We have a function in the middle called date format, but it contains a function within it called now. Okay, so this is kind of identifying different parts of this Cold Fusion script that are tags and functions. 
Let's talk about CFML tags for a moment. There's around 170 of them. They're all surrounded by greater than or less than signs. They all start with CF, that identifies it as a cold fusion tag. Some tags have attributes, some don't. Some tags have closing tags, some don't. Um, the best resources to learn more about the cold fusion tags is the Adobe documentation or cfdocs.org. Some of the common CFML tags that you will see when you are looking at cold fusion code uh, CF output. CF output tells Cold Fusion to parse the content within these tags between the start and end tag. Everything in there needs to be parsed by Cold Fusion. CF if, CF else if, and CF else also provide uh, if then and else logic. If this, then do this. Else do this. CF mail is a tag used for sending emails through Cold Fusion. CF query is a tag used to execute SQL commands on a database. You also have CF loop for looping over lists, arrays, queries, etc. CF include allows you to be able to include one file within another. These are just some of the more common tags. Some cold fusion tags need to be closed. And how you do that is you basically create another copy of the tag with a slash at the end of it. The CF output tag must be closed so that cold fusion server knows where to stop processing the CFML that's contained within it. Same thing with a mail tag. Uh, the CF mail tag has to be closed so that the server knows where the email ends. But then you have other tags that don't need to be closed, such as uh, CF include. CF include is just include this file here, so that tag does not need to be closed. Let's take a look at some CFML functions. There are around 700 of them. They do everything from data manipulation to database connections to page relocation and much, much, much more. They all follow a similar pattern of function with parentheses, the name of the function with, with parameters contained within parentheses. Uh, like tags, some functions have attributes. Functions do not need to be closed. Some of the common CFML functions are things like date format for formatting a date, array new and struct new for creating arrays and structures. There are also more ways to create arrays and structures in script notation. Uh, we will discuss that later. Hash for creating a one-way hash of string data. Replace and replace no case for replacing a substring within a string. Much like tags, a lot of CFML functions have attributes. Uh, for example, the date format function takes two attributes uh, to determine the date to be formatted and the date mask to apply. The array new function takes a single attribute to determine which type of array to create. The now function takes no attributes whatsoever. Some other details about CFML. Uh, pound signs or hashtags, depending on what generation you were born into, are used to tell the Cold Fusion server where parsing begins and ends for a particular piece of code. Uh, remember that Cold Fusion code is parsed server side. So the information used is the information from the server. If you were to create um, some Cold Fusion code that said time format now, it's going to return the time on the server, not where the user is. And that's kind of important because some people don't understand that. CFML is also just in time compiled. Uh, so there's no need to compile your CFML code. It gets compiled at the time of the request. Cold Fusion markup language can be written in two different ways. It can either be tag based or script based. Starting off with a tag based request, um, this is an example of some tag based CFML. Everything uses the open angle tag based. Uh, syntax to be able to create variables, manipulate variables, so on and so forth. Let's take a look at that exact same code, except in script-based format. Um, script starts off with CF script, ends with an NCF script tag, and everything in a script-based format is a lot more like JavaScript. Um, so you can declare variables a little differently. Um, you have to use write output to be able to display things on the web page itself. Looping can be handled a little bit differently, so on and so forth. These two pieces of code do exactly the same thing. So at this point, some developers might ask the question, which one should I use and which one is better? Um, to be honest, there are no rules when it comes to this stuff. It depends on what you're comfortable with and uh, what works for you. Tags and script are functionally equivalent. Neither one is faster than the other one. Uh, so you can feel free to use one or the other or a combination of both. It's all a matter of preference. So again, let's take a look at what the code reads. I wrote these three lines of CFML code. Let's take a look at how Cold Fusion interprets it. It looks at the first line and it says CF output. Oh, I need to process everything from here to the end CF output tag. 
the date format now uh, D D D D M M M M D Y Y Y Y says format the results of the now function, which is going to be today's date, and use the full day, full month, single digit date, and full year. Third line, the NCF output tells the Cold Fusion server, okay, I can stop processing now. There's nothing more in between here that I need to parse. And what ends up getting returned to the browser is just a simple date. So that was my first three lines of Cold Fusion code. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, but basically what it is, is it's a chart that says how confident somebody is from knowing nothing about a subject matter to being a guru on a subject matter. You know, based on their wisdom, their knowledge plus their experience, what changes in their confidence? And the typical Dunning-Kruger graph says that you go from knowing nothing about a topic subject to knowing a little bit. And once you know a little bit, your confidence shoots straight up. And then once you start to learn a little bit more, it kind of craters. And then over time, what happens is you slowly start to gain that confidence back until you become an expert. Well, after writing my first three lines of Cold Fusion code, and posting it to the server and waiting up until midnight and pressing F5 to make sure that I was refreshing and refreshing. And then as soon as midnight hit, seeing that date switch automatically because Cold Fusion knew that it was no longer Monday, it was Tuesday and I needed to display Tuesday instead of Monday. I was sitting right here in a little position that most psychologists refer to as Mount Stupid. Little did I know that my confidence was about to crater and I was about to fall down here into the valley of despair. Because again, the vice president of the company came up to me and he made another request. He said, David, listeners should be able to make song requests online that get sent directly to the on-air studio. Okay. Here I am down in the valley of despair. But doing a little research and learning and trying different things, I started to learn how to send email with Cold Fusion. My solution being able to send email through Cold Fusion um, started off with a single page, form.cfm. And on this form.cfm, I had an HTML form. It was pretty basic. It started off with a form tag uh, that posted the information to another page called action.cfm. I had a label that said, what's your name? Followed by an input for the person's name. I had a label for what song do you want to hear? Uh, followed by an input for the song. I had a label for what artist sings that song, followed by an input for the artist, and then I had a submit button. Very basic HTML form, pretty standard. This information got posted to an action.cfm. That action.cfm had things like a CF mail tag, and I was sending that mail to request at comp.com from website at comp.com. The subject was going to be song request. Um, it was gonna be a text-based email. And then I ended the CF mail tag. Within the body of the email, I said, form.name would like to hear form.song by form.artist. And then I ended the mail and finally displayed a message that said, thanks for the request. This is very basic, but it was a very powerful way to be able to send emails to the on-air studio right from Cold Fusion. Let's take a closer look at that form.cfm because there's some things going on there that I didn't like. I didn't like the fact that there was no validation. I didn't like the fact that somebody could come to the page, simply click the submit button and send us effectively a blank email, an email with no information in it. So what I did was I went back to that form.cfm file and I changed the form from a standard HTML form tag to a CF form tag and I gave it the same attributes. The label stayed the same, but then my input, instead of just being a standard text input, became a CF input, type equals text, and I added some additional attributes that are available to Cold Fusion. Things like required equals true, and message equals name is required. Uh, the label stayed the same for the song, same thing for the song. I added a CF input, required equals true. Label for the artist, same thing for the artist, required equals true, with artist is required. And then had my submit button, ended my CF form. Now what this did was it made it so that when the user came to the page and clicked the submit button without filling out the form, it would pop up a JavaScript uh, warning to the person to say, hey, you didn't fill out these following fields. 
So going back to my Dunning-Kruger effect, I had gone from the top of Mount Stupid down into the Valley of Despair, and now here I am again on what I like to refer to as Mount Stupid, the sequel. Because truth be told, I was not a cold fusion expert at this point. I didn't have enough knowledge and experience to be able to consider myself an expert in the field, but I knew enough that my confidence was way up, I could tell you that. An important thing to note is that modern web development discourages the use of cold fusion based UI components like CF form. If there's a cold fusion developer watching this and seeing that I had given a demonstration on CF form, they probably would have shuddered and said, Ooh, God, don't do that in 2020. I can tell you that. But in 1998, that was the way to get this done. My next programming challenge came when one of the radio executives, one of the sales guys came up to me and they said, David, you made a website for the radio station. Can you make one for my advertising client? And I said, that sounds like an interesting challenge. Yeah, I can do that. And he said, that's fine. They need to collect employment applications and email them to their human resources department as a PDF file. Well, you can imagine where I was on the Dunning-Kruger graph again. Here I am back in Valley of Despair Part 2. And this continued as my cycle of development. I would come across a new challenge, but I would find a relatively quick and easy way to be able to accomplish or overcome that challenge using cold fusion. Now, to be clear, we've only scratched the surface of the capabilities of cold fusion. There are literally thousands of capabilities that cold fusion has that I haven't even touched the surface of. Truth be told, in my 20 years of web application development, I have never come across a challenge that I couldn't resolve using Cold Fusion in some way, shape, or form. Next, I'd like to talk about some of the major Cold Fusion frameworks, which, of course, starts with the question what is a framework? By my definition, a framework are coding standards and rules that define how your application is built. Now, the first time that I wrote that, I had a problem with that word rules because really, they're more like guidelines than you'd call actual rules. So I went back and I redefined it to say that a framework are coding standards and guidelines that defines how an application is built. Some of the advantages of using a framework are that it sets coding standards. A framework can remove some of the overhead from the development process. Um, if you're working with a very large scale application or have multiple developers working on an application, uh, it can remove some of that overhead that is required when you're scaffolding the application to begin with. A framework clearly defines where code should exist. Um, by that I mean, typically the framework will say that the code that is used to pull information from the database gets placed in a file like this, whereas the code used to display that information from the database is displayed in a file like that. Using a framework assists in knowledge transfer. When you have multiple developers working on the same framework, if those two developers both know that framework inside and out, they're speaking the same language when they're developing the application, which of course promotes a multiple developer approach. I believe there are some disadvantages to using a framework. Uh, many times a framework can be overkill. I didn't need a framework for my stupid little contact form. A framework can limit the way that software is developed, although it typically won't. Um, some frameworks are very explicit in the way that they are supposed to do things, and they're designed in ways that can be somewhat rigid. Using a framework can add overhead to the development process. It can also obfuscate or add layers of unnecessary complexity to your code base. Many frameworks divvy up the responsibilities of the code into multiple different files and tracking those down through different layers of an application can sometimes be a little bit more challenging. My general rules on frameworks are that much like Cold Fusion, a development framework is one tool in a very large toolbox. Use the practice that works best for your business. Don't be afraid to try a framework with your developers. And if it works for your business, use it. If it doesn't, then don't. I will talk about modern and legacy cold fusion frameworks. The difference between these two being that modern cold fusion frameworks are actively being developed and maintained by the people who are responsible for the framework. Legacy cold fusion frameworks still exist. However, they're no longer actively maintained by anyone or have fallen out of favor with the cold fusion community.
Probably the most popular modern cold fusion framework is Coldbox, created by Luis Mahano of Orta Solutions, widely accepted as the de facto standard for CF frameworks in 2020. Another major framework is Framework One, originally created by Sean Corfield, uh, maintained by Stephen Neeland. Framework One is dubbed the invisible framework for its lightweight footprint and its ease of use. The third major modern cold fusion framework is CF Wheels. This is an open source CFML framework similar to Ruby on Rails. Taking a look at the legacy cold fusion frameworks, these include Fusebox, Mach 2, and Model Glue. Now, it's important to note that none of the above frameworks are being actively maintained. However, Fusebox, Mach 2, and Model Glue applications do still exist out there in the wild. Let's discuss some cold fusion resources. And when we do so, I will talk about different types of resources, including uh, integrated development environments, IDEs, and code editors that support cold fusion. We'll talk about some companies that specialize in cold fusion development. We'll talk about companies that specialize in cold fusion hosting. We'll discuss documentation and learning for cold fusion, some websites and industry expert blogs, some social resources on where to find cold fusion developers some employer and job seeker resources, and finally some conferences and events. First up is IDEs and code editors, and there is an important difference between an IDE and a code editor. An IDE is an integrated development environment. This is a set of tools that work together, uh, typically includes a code editor and different features like syntax highlighting, usually a compiler, a debugger, some form of server manager. It's a lot more robust than what's typically considered a code editor. A code editor is much more simple and streamlined. It does a few things and it does them very well, but most code editors can be extended through plugins and extensions. This allows you to add the features that you need to your code editor without requiring all of the overhead of a full-blown IDE. Adobe's entry into the IDE market is Adobe Cold Fusion Builder. Um, it is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. It is an IDE built off of the open source Eclipse IDE. For my purposes, I generally believe that Cold Fusion Builder is kind of like driving a Mac truck to go get groceries. It is so much more powerful and has so many more features than I would ever use. Adobe Cold Fusion Builder is a commercial product that costs $299 for a perpetual license. Next up is Microsoft Visual Studio Code. It is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's a code editor based on the Electron framework. Visual Studio Code has extensions for almost anything you would want to do programming-wise. It's open source on the MIT license, which means it's free. And uh, here's a pro tip. If you're trying to decide, choose VS Code. The next generation of Adobe Cold Fusion Builder is going to be Visual Studio Code based. Next up is Sublime Text, available for Windows, Mac, or Linux. It's an absolutely spectacular code editor built using Python. Again, has extensions for almost anything you would want to do programming wise. It's a commercial product and it's $80 for a perpetual license. Next up is the Atom editor available for Windows, Mac and Linux. It's a code editor developed by GitHub, has extensions for almost anything you'd want to do programming wise. Are you starting to see a trend here? Open source, it's on the MIT license and it's free. It's also important to note that this does not represent all of the IDEs or code editors that support Cold Fusion, uh, specifically JetBrains IntelliJ, I believe supports Cold Fusion, if not natively, then through extension. Um, however, this is not meant to be a comprehensive list. I'm sure there are other IDEs and code editors out there that support Cold Fusion. If you are interested in engaging the services of a company that specializes in Cold Fusion development, here's a list of some of them, of course. I think I might be in trouble if I didn't mention the one that I work for first, Epicenter Consulting, uh, available at epicenterconsulting.com. However, all of the companies on this list, including Ortis Solutions, Foundio, TerraTech, each of these companies are experts in the field of cold fusion and have very capable developers on staff. Um, there are also many more varying in size and focus. If you look locally for a cold fusion shop, you may be able to find one. Some of the companies that specialize in cold fusion hosting include Hostech, Media3, CF Dynamics, Vivio Technologies, uh, New Tech Technology Services, although that's one that I can't recommend as of late, simply because they've had too many issues with security and reliability lately for me to be able to put a stamp of approval on it. 
All of these companies provide hosting plans for small businesses that include some version of Cold Fusion on one level or another. And it's everything from shared hosting right up to the, your own dedicated machines. Another company specializing in Cold Fusion hosting is Coalesce via Amazon Web Services. So you can actually purchase a Cold Fusion AMI straight through Amazon Web Services and get your own Cold Fusion server up and running in just minutes. There are many more hosting companies that support Cold Fusion, but these are the major ones. The next resource I'd like to discuss about Cold Fusion centers around documentation and learning. Helpx.adobe.com slash ColdFusion is Adobe's official ColdFusion documentation. However, uh, there's another site called cfdocs.org that I personally find to be a little bit better organized and easier to understand than the official Adobe documentation. CF Docs was created by Foundio Solutions and Pete Freetag. He is a tremendous resource for the ColdFusion community and an expert in his field. Uh, CF Docs is community supported. Another website is learncfinaweek.com, which was recently updated uh, with self-guided tutorials on all things Cold Fusion, so that you can pick up and run and try to figure out Cold Fusion on your own. There are more resources out there like trycf.com and cffiddle. These are sites that allow you to be able to write small pieces of Cold Fusion code and execute them against a Cold Fusion server to be able to toy around and see how it works. Some of the websites and industry expert blogs surrounding Cold Fusion include the Cold Fusion Community Portal, available at coldfusion.adobe.com. Epicenter Consulting also has our Epicenter Cold Fusion blog at epicenterconsulting.com slash blog. Ben Nadell has probably answered every single question a Cold Fusion developer could possibly have and tackled any problem that anybody has ever known. Um, he has a great Cold Fusion blog at bendadel.com. Ray Camden uh, at raymondcamden.com also has a lot of information about Cold Fusion. Uh, some of the other industry expert blogs are Brad Woods, Pete Freetags, Charlie Earhart. Charlie's a great guy and can talk your ear off about a lot of things Cold Fusion and technology based in general. And finally, Michaela Light. Let's discuss some of the social resources that are available around Cold Fusion. These are places that you can find Cold Fusion developers or other people just willing to talk about Cold Fusion. So uh, the first being Adobe Cold Fusion Summit that takes place every year. This year it's going to be virtual. Um, the CFML Slack channel. If you are ever on Slack, join the CFML Slack channel and you can ask any question and get answers from experts almost immediately. The Cold Fusion Programmers Group on Facebook is a pretty active Facebook group that consists of many Cold Fusion programmers. And finally, Charlie Earhart hosts the online Cold Fusion Meetup and typically provides a great presentation on something Cold Fusion related. If you're an employer who is looking to hire the services of a Cold Fusion developer, or maybe you're a Cold Fusion developer looking to find a new job, here are some employer and job seeker resources available to the Cold Fusion community. Again, the CFML Slack that I mentioned earlier has a jobs channel. If you post a job in the CFML Slack jobs channel, you will get inundated with resumes, from what I understand. The Cold Fusion job resource and Cold Fusion remote jobs groups on Facebook are great places to be able to find Cold Fusion developers. And of course, Cold Fusion Summit. What better way to find another Cold Fusion developer than by socializing with them, meeting them face to face, and talking to them about what they're looking for? There are four major conferences and events surrounding Cold Fusion. The first two are put on by Adobe directly, and that is Cold Fusion Summit East and Cold Fusion Summit West. These are hosted by Adobe, typically held in Washington, D.C. in spring and Las Vegas in autumn. Uh, Cold Fusion Summit 2020 is going to be entirely online due to the pandemic, and you can find more information at cfsummit.adobe.com. Into the Box is a fantastic cold box framework conference put on by Ortis Solutions. It's typically held in Houston in the late spring. Uh, Into the Box 2020 was online, and you can find more information at intothebox.org. CF Camp is typically held in Munich, Germany in autumn. Who knows what's going to happen this year with uh, CF Camp, but more information is available online at cfcamp.org. Next, I'd like to talk about some facts and misconceptions about cold fusion itself. There's a lot of misinformation, and bad reputations, and old ways of thinking out there about cold fusion, and I'm here to try to clear some of them up. 
The first and largest misconception about cold fusion is that it is a dead language. Now, in my opinion, that is an outright lie. I have been told for 20 years that cold fusion is dead or cold fusion is dying or nobody uses cold fusion anymore. And I got to tell you, I have built a very good career off of that quote unquote dead language. So I don't believe this whatsoever. Cold Fusion keeps growing, it keeps getting better, it keeps getting faster, it keeps adding more features. And to date, I feel it is one of the best programming languages available. I believe that some of that reputation comes from the concept that finding qualified Cold Fusion developers can be challenging. This is true. The Cold Fusion developer community is a very small community. It's very passionate. It's very talented, however, it is very small, and that's the purposes of videos like this, to introduce more people to Cold Fusion so that they understand how absolutely amazing it can be. Another perception of Cold Fusion is that it is not an object-oriented language. Technically, this is true. It's tag-based and script-based, but it is not explicitly object-oriented. However, a lot of developers will take that and think that Cold Fusion cannot be an object-oriented language. This is false. Cold Fusion has many features that make it very object-oriented, as object-oriented as any other object-oriented language available. The golden thing about Cold Fusion is that its flexibility means that the developer gets to decide whether or not they choose to write Cold Fusion in an object-oriented way. Some people have said that enterprise companies are not using Cold Fusion. This is false. The fact is that enterprises absolutely use Cold Fusion. If you take a look at the Fortune 100 companies, 72% are currently using Cold Fusion in some fashion or another. If you expand that out to the Fortune 500, 63% are using Cold Fusion. An Adobe customer survey found that 70% of their Cold Fusion customers rate Cold Fusion as their most important technology. And as such, 70% of customers using Cold Fusion are using it for brand new development. Cold Fusion enjoys market penetration across a broad range of industries, including aerospace and defense, apparel, industrials, media, motor vehicles and parts, telecommunications, transportation, and wholesale. Not only does Cold Fusion penetrate these markets, it has 100% market penetration across these industries. And I believe this absolutely proves that Cold Fusion enjoys enterprise use worldwide. I've spoken with developers who believe that Cold Fusion is not as secure as other languages. This is false. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at some reported security vulnerabilities by platform between 2014 and 2018. And for sake of example, I'll examine some of the top four programming languages like .NET, Ruby on Rails, PHP, and Cold Fusion. Taking a look at .NET, between those four years, they had 45 reported security vulnerabilities, which was admirable. Ruby on Rails came in slightly lower at 38. PHP actually surprised me. I thought that it was very secure, but uh, turns out 210 reported security vulnerabilities. And finally, Cold Fusion comes in at the lowest with only 17. Finally, some business owners believe that small companies or startups can't afford a Cold Fusion license. Now, in my opinion, this is both true and false. It's true that the commercial cost of an enterprise Cold Fusion license, if you're buying it brand new, is very expensive. It's just shy of $10,000. And for a lot of small companies, that's an exorbitant fee just for software licensing. However, there are ways that small businesses can afford to be running on top of Cold Fusion. There are Cold Fusion hosting companies that provide licenses with their hosting packages. There are also cloud-based services like Amazon Web Services that has an AMI for Cold Fusion that allows you to be able to pay for it in advance or even hourly. And for people who aren't interested in either of those solutions, there are open source CFML parsing engines available out there. In today's discussion, we discussed the basics of how the web works, the basics of how Cold Fusion works, some simple Cold Fusion syntax. We talked about the major Cold Fusion frameworks. I gave you an overview of the Cold Fusion developer community and how to find some Cold Fusion resources. And finally, we discussed some facts and misconceptions. I'd like to leave you with some words that will hopefully inspire you to check out Cold Fusion. No matter where you are in your development journey, you have to start somewhere. Cold Fusion has been making hard things easy for coders for over 25 years. Maybe it's a tool that you can use to, well, chase that balloon.